we believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. In other words, we believe in rightly dividing verses to the right group of people in the right time period. Because if you don't do that, then you're going to combine all the verses together and come up with major wrong doctrine. Now, what I'm going to do in this video, this particular video, I'm going to give some uh, easy proofs and to make people understand why you have to believe in dispensationalism. Okay, so dispensationalism, as I've mentioned before, it's rightly dividing the verses to the right group of people and the right time period. Because that is a practice from the Word of God. The Word of God calls it rightly dividing the Amen. Word of Truth. Amen. That is extremely important to understand. Rightly dividing. Now, if you look at modern Bibles, they would say handling. Handling rather than dividing. No, the Bible wants you to divide the Word of God. So, it is a command to rightly divide verses. This is why we believe in dispensationalism. Everyone at heart is a dispensationalist, whether you like it or not. Even those who claim that they are not dispensational, they are dispensational at heart. And we're going to be proving this. So basically what we're going to do right here is that I'm going to divide it to four time periods, mainly four time periods. Now they vary with, in classical dispensationalism, they'll go with somewhere between from six to eight, but it doesn't matter with that. What matters is, is that there are differences in the Bible. That is a matter of fact. To make it simple for the people, I'm going to divide it into four. Old Testament, and then here we'll have the church age. That's where we're at, all right, because we are the church. So like you see in a map, I'm going to write it here, you are here, all right? That way you all don't get lost. <laughs> now, unfortunately, Unfortunately, a lot of people who fall into heresy, they just don't see this. You are here. They go all over the board. They go all over the board. All right. So then we're going to also see right here, tribulation. A lot of people mix this up with this one, which you don't want to do. And another thing right here is called the millennium. So it's a 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. Now, primarily, what you're going to notice right here is that since this is a church age, it's a church, right? So we believe in the church. So this is our era here, okay? This is our era here. And then what you're going to notice right here is that obviously in the Old Testament, this was Israel. And then what's going to happen is during the tribulation, God's going to go back to Israel. And then Israel will be fully established in the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. Now, in between here, which is important to understand, is what we call the transitional era. The transitional era was when Jesus Christ and the apostles were ministering still in Israel. If you know your Bible, Jesus and the apostles were first ministering in Israel. But then transitioning, where it was transitioning toward, toward Gentiles, right? Hence, that's why it reached the church eventually. So this is a transitional area where Israel was heading toward the era of the church because it was separating from the Jews toward the Gentiles. So this is an idea about dispensationalism. See that? So different groups of people. See that? We're different from Israel. And then different time periods. If you understand this, then you're going to get an idea when you read your Bible, which doctrine applies to who. Now, people would like to de uh, deny dispensationalism, but we're going to prove it right here that there is. Uh, some people who call themselves pastors when they're not pastors, some of them who are part of cults, weird systems, they would try to claim that, no, it's only Old Testament, New Testament, the end, you know. Well, that's the end of your doctrine, I'm sure. But the thing is, is that dispensationalism, it's going to last till the end of time, as God calls it to be. Now, Old Testament, New Testament, it's not that simple. The reason why is, let's look at Hebrews chapter 8. And then keep your hand in 2 Timothy 2. We're going to go back here. Hebrews chapter 8, notice right here, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. 
For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, anti-dispensationalists, they will claim that the verse 7, the first covenant, is the Old Testament. And then verse 8 is the New Testament. Why, that is not true. I'm going to shock you here. This is not Old Testament, New Testament. I'm going to show you. Verse 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Okay, so we can guess what that is. That is definitely during the Old Testament, right? So we see this is during the Old Testament. Okay, then is this new covenant the church age? Is this the New Testament the church age? Actually, keep reading. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with who? The house of Israel. Okay, so that is not you, the Christian church. This is the house of Israel. Let's keep reading. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now, anti-dispensationalists, they would like to claim that the church is the replacement of Israel. So they will claim that whenever the Bible mentions Israel or Jew later on in the New Testament, that it's referring to the Christian church. So we're basically spiritual Israel, the anti-dispensationalists will claim. The problem with that teaching is this, is that what we're going to find out here is that this is not a spiritual Israel. This is not the church replacing the nation of Israel. Because let's keep reading, okay? How can this be the church? Verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Now, isn't the Christian church supposed to preach the gospel to every creature? Aren't we supposed to witness about Jesus Christ around the whole world and tell everyone to know the Lord? Amen. Okay, then how can verse 11 in this new covenant... If this Israel is a church, how come we can't say no to the Lord? You got a problem there. So this is not Old Testament, New Testament, the end. No, it's the end of your brain. You weren't really thinking carefully right here. Okay? What you're going to find out right here is verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their what? Sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Who is the sins and iniquities that he remembers no more? Look at Romans 11. Now keep your hand at 2 Timothy 2, but jump to Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. Now look at anti-dispensationalists fumble in explaining Romans 11. It is very powerful, Romans 11. It yeah. proves that God is not done with the nation of Israel. Amen. So we know right here, the nation of Israel, God's no longer using, using them. They're temporarily cast off. But see these? He's going to continue. So obviously, this is the old one. It's decayed. It's vanished away. But then Israel's going to be in full restoration here. So this is the reason why, because in the 1,000 year millennial reign of Jesus Christ, who's ruling on the earth? God. Won't the whole world already know God? Yes, because he's ruling on the earth. So it makes sense that Hebrews chapter 8 is referring to this time period, because it's talking about Israel. Now, if they would like to say that, no, this is referring to the Christian church, they were not reading Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8 says Judah and Israel. Okay, if you think that's the church, then who's Judah and who's the northern tribes? Yeah. Amen. That does not make sense, okay? Which tribe are you, okay? So probably Brother Eric is from the tribe of Levi, and Brother Jack is from the tribe of Naphtali, and we all just don't know, okay? And we're just going to have to count our fingers and figure out who's who. So then the thing is, is see, that does not make sense. It makes more sense when you leave the Bible as it says, and you literally take the verse as it says. The sign of a cult is not leaving the verse as it says. When they try to insert their spiritual, metaphorical, esoteric, mysterious interpretation over it, you just leave it as it says. 
If it says Adam and Eve, then you know it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. You can't just insert some kind of spiritual, metaphorical, esoteric interpretation over it, okay? You can replace anybody if you're going to do a metaphorical, spiritual interpretation. But if you leave it literal as it says, then you let the Bible stand by itself. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So Israel is temporarily blind. Verse 26. And so what? All Israel shall be saved. Okay. So the nation of Israel itself is going to be saved. But let's keep reading. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn what? Away ungodliness from Jacob. Verse 27, for this is my covenant unto them. Ah, remember Hebrews 8, their covenant? When I shall take away their what? Sin. Why, that matches Hebrews 8. So it makes more, remember Hebrews 8? The new covenant, when I will take away their sins. So isn't that Israel then? That's Israel. You can't say Israel's a church. Otherwise, verse 25, you're going to have to admit that the church is blinded and God turned away and gave up the church. See? So that doesn't make sense. Now, a lot of them would like to say this, okay? What they would like to say is to pull up this uh, clever argument where they're going to be closet dispensationalists because they got caught right here. So they got caught that Israel has to be restored no matter what. So there's no way they can argue their way around it. So anti-dispensationalists, they have to force themselves into dispensationalism while pretending to deny it. You know what they now say, some of them? Some anti-dispensationalists now say, well, what this is referring to is the nation of Israel who finally believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. But the unbelieving Jews, those who don't believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, they're cast off. Hence, the nation of Israel is still ongoing because of some of those people who still believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. So, they themselves just admitted to you that Israel would be restored then. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want to admit that though. They don't want to admit it. They want to insist right here that no, 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 this is referring to Israel who becomes a church. That's what they might argue right here. They might argue, no, we're saying that Israel becomes a church. No, you can't say that. You just admitted, so you catch them. You admitted in verse 25 through 28, you believe there's a difference with Israel and the church. They just admitted it right there because they believe that verse 25 through 28 is literal Israel, physical Jews who are different from the church because the church is still saved under the gospel while the nation of Israel is cast aside. They're closet dispensationalists. So when they pretend that they deny dispensationalism, they're actually adorning dispensationalism because they know their movement, their doctrine, their biblical interpretation cannot stand without dispensationalism. Whether you like it or not, everyone is a closet dispensationalist. So the thing is right here in verse 28, it's very apparent. There's a difference with Israel and the church. It is very apparent is verse 28. As concerning the gospel, right, the Christian gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. See that? Israel. That's obviously physical Israel, not the church. Because physical Israel is an enemy of the gospel for your sake. You're the church. You saw that? Okay. So look at the verse. That way you can understand where I'm driving at here. As concerning the Christian gospel... The gospel, they are enemies. See, Jews are enemies for your sake, Christian sakes. But as touching the what? So, wait a minute. That means they're still part of the election. As touching the election, they, the Jews, are what? Beloved. For whose sakes? The forefathers, the father's sake. See that? So, physical Israel. So notice that the physical nation of Israel is still beloved for the Father's sake. That's why you got to be careful what you watch online. Watch online is always a bit of truth, not the full truth. So it is a matter of fact that there are a lot of Jewish elites, okay? There's no doubt that there are Jewish elites. As a matter of fact, 
the Antichrist is going to be a Jew. I don't know if you knew that, all right? So that is a matter of fact. But you got to understand this. God's going to kick those people out. And what he has is that the current nation of Israel that you have today, you got to understand this. These people are beloved for the father's sake. The Jews in the nation of Israel today, they're still beloved. They're counted as the elect. But online, they're giving out this weird stuff about the Khazars and fake Jews. But see, what Satan's trying to do is trying to make you, in verse 28, violate that. They're still the elect for the Father's sake. You understand that. But there are Jewish elites over there. Yeah, that's right. They're going to turn against the nation of Israel. They are going to betray and turn against the whole nation of Israel. Didn't you read Matthew 24? What did Matthew 24 say? The Jews are going to run away when the Antichrist persecutes them. The Antichrist has to be a Jew because he has to make peace with the Jews. He has to make a peace treaty, a covenant. See that? So look, you're not going to be a successful one world ruler who will rule over Israel if you start to betray them and talk bad about them. See, he has to pretend to be one of them. And then he's going to betray them at the end at Matthew chapter 24. So you got to realize this. The current people at the nation of Israel today, they are beloved for the Father's sake. They are still God's chosen people. No, they're not, Pastor. They're evil. They're wicked. They do this and this and this. Did you read Hebrews 8? Did you read Romans 11? God said that they're temporarily cast aside, but he will one day restore them. Th their sins and their iniquities will be taken care of. God's going to set his people right. You, have you read the Old Testament, how many times the nation of Israel lived in wickedness? They sacrificed their babies to the god Molech. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. They were really wicked. If you think Israel's wicked now, you should see them in the Old Testament. They were extremely evil. But what did God say? God said that they're still my nation and my people. So it's God's job to fix them up, not you. D don't worry about the Jews, all right? God, that's God's problem. If you study the history of the Jews, you know what they went through, all right? You don't have to worry about them. I think God's more than enough to take care of his own people. So you got to understand this, is that there is absolutely no doubt there's a difference with Israel and the church, and there's a distinction right here. All right, now let's look at another distinction. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And then once you have Matthew chapter 5, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. All right. Old Testament, New Testament, the end. Well, no, that's not true. See, you notice right here that after the church, there is a distinction, right? Okay, there's no doubt about that. You have to put a distinction here. Because... Hebrew, we believe in preaching the gospel to every creature. Amen? Amen? Mark 16. Hebrews 8 says, no, you don't do that. Oh, by the way, I guess people have not read the book of Zechariah. In the book of Zechariah, you know what happens when you tell them that? About knowing the Lord and you try to prophesy and preach to them? You are to be thrust through with the spear. So anti-dispensationalists who believe in about preaching the gospel to everybody... And, oh yeah, Hebrews 8 covenant applies to me. All of you, according, if, that, if you really believe that, all of you should thrust yourselves with the spear then. See, that don't make sense, right? Yeah. That don't make sense. You guys wouldn't probably have the guts to do it either because you don't believe in the word of God. Amen. So you see right here? So the word of God shows that you thrust yourself with the spear if you believe today is that covenant and you can't say, know the Lord. Unless you believe that's for the millennium then. A millennium, not for the church age, because there are so many people who don't know the Lord. But in the millennium, what did God say at Isaiah, at the book of Isaiah? All shall know me from the least to the greatest. Okay, now let's look at Matthew chapter 5, okay? It, it's not Old Testament, New Testament, the end. You got to read right here that there are so many distinctions. So let's read Matthew chapter 5. And I had some people who actually uh, miss who actually thought that I was going to burn in hell because I said the word fool. Look at Matthew 5, 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. 
And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say what? Thou fool, Thou fool shall be in danger of what? Hellfire. Okay. Uh -oh. All right. <laughs> Anti-dispensationalists are a bunch of fools. Oh, I'm going to hell now, right? <laughs> Look at Luke 24. Luke 24. What about God who said the fool has said in his heart there is no God? At the book of Psalms. Is God going to hell then? Well, what, well, what is going on, Pastor? Well, look at Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. And then notice what the Word of God says. What did Jesus say? Jesus said that at verse 25, Then said he unto them, O oh, what? Fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Why, look at that. Jesus called them fools. Isn't it hypocritical that Jesus said at Matthew 5, if you call each other a fool, you're in danger of hell fire. And then Luke 24, Jesus says, thou fool. Isn't Jesus a liar and a hypocrite then? Or, or is Matthew 5 something else? So go to Matthew 5 again. Go back to Matthew 5. You know what? This is, so you believe in dispensationalism. Whether you like it or not, you do. Okay, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5. Now, look at what kind of kingdom he's preaching about here. What kind of kingdom? We're going to look at verse uh, 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of what? Heaven. 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 Look at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of what? Heaven. Heaven. All right. Now, look at verse 23. And Jesus, uh, of chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the what? Kingdom. Kingdom. Who was this to? Look at verse 24. And his fame went throughout all Syria. Look at verse 25. And there followed him great multitudes of people from where? Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. You see that? So notice that in Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 4, that this is to Jews. And it's the gospel of the what? It said kingdom, right? When will God set his kingdom on the earth? Why, he's reigning for a thousand years. That makes sense. And who's the group of people here? Israel, Jews. That makes sense. So, why is it that they can't call each other a fool? Because everyone is going to be a good guy over there. Everyone has to follow God's rules over there. So you can't call an atheist a fool anymore. You can't call a heretic a fool anymore because there are no fools in this millennium. Everyone is following God's system and rule. There's no enemy out there, nobody to teach and preach about because... Everyone knows God now, from the least to the greatest. See that? That's why it's right for you not to call each other a fool. It makes sense now. So whether you like it or not, you do believe in dispensationalism. Now here's another thing. Go to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Do you really believe that the church will go through the tribulation. That should be false. The church is separate from the tribulation. See this? See this? Okay? This is a church age. Tribulation is during the time of Israel. Now, the thing is this, is that the church teaches salvation by faith alone, not by works. Amen? All right. Faith and works are out. Works are out. It's only believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we have to worry about, I have to hold on to my faith. I have to not deny Jesus under strenuous torture and persecution. I'm going to cling on. No, you don't have to worry about that. All right? How many of you are willing to be tortured for the name of Jesus Christ and you don't have to raise your hand on that one? Isn't it great that God didn't lay, it, lay down a rule for you to get saved, you have to be willing to suffer immense torture for my name's sake. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I think we'd all probably go to hell after that. 
God says, all you have to do is believe on the name of my son for salvation, right? But see, in the tribulation, you're not just going through any kind of normal persecution. You're going under the persecution of hell itself from the Antichrist. And they have to not deny Jesus. They have to hold on to their faith. They have to be willing to go through the persecution and not yield to the Antichrist system by not taking the mark of the beast. That is a lot of work, especially when you can only eat and buy and sell with the mark of the beast. So you have to be willing to face starvation, persecution, hell's persecution for your salvation at the tribulation. Look at Revelation chapter 14. That proves there's a difference with the church age right here and the tribulation. Look at Revelation 14. We'll look at verse uh, 11, 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. See that? So you burn in hell for all eternity if you accept the mark of the beast. But look at people who claim, okay, no, 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 no. This is faith alone for salvation. No, this is not faith alone for salvation. Let, let's use some common sense. You, if you're going to use common sense, you think that's faith alone for your salvation? To resist the persecution of hell itself and not denying the faith? And not yielding to the devil's system? You call that faith alone? Or is that a lot of work? That is a lot of work to hold on to your faith, to not deny the name of Jesus, to face starvation. Amen. And if you guys insist, no, that's faith, well, you're wrong. Why? Because Pastor Kim says so? No, because verse 12 says so. Here, see that is explaining that. It's explaining this mark of the beast thing. Here is the patience, a lot of patience. You have to resist it. Of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. See that? That's truly faith and works for salvation. If you call this faith alone, then I'm really sorry. Then I, I really don't know what I can say to you. I really don't know. Anyone with common sense can see this is faith and works. I mean, even the Bible says so. Well, this is faith alone for Jesus Christ. So then, if you insist this is faith alone in Jesus Christ, what makes you different from lordship salvation? Where you truly have the faith, and so, by these works, that you won't deny Jesus, that you won't yield in to sin, and etc., etc. That's... What makes you different from other religions who teach we are all saved by faith, but you know, if you truly have faith, you're going to have works with it. See that? Now, you anti-dispensationalists are going to have a hard time explaining that. So that's why there is no doubt that there is a distinction right here. There is a distinction right here. And this also proves, whether you like it or not, this proves the church cannot be here. The church cannot be here at the tribulation. We're raptured. We're gone. Scripture with scripture. So you do scripture with scripture. Okay. So there's no doubt. Okay. This would fail to include so many things in the Old Testament. Okay. So let's go to Galatians chapter 3 now. Galatians chapter 3. So in this teaching, I'm not even pouring out my thorough debunking of anti-dispensationalism. I didn't even do it. All of this is just from the top of my head. Okay? You don't want to see me pouring it all on. You don't want to see me doing that. If I do that, then you probably won't teach anti-dispensationalism again because you'd be too embarrassed to do so. So the thing is, is, this is all just from the top of my head. So this is very apparent. You have to divide, divide verses to the right time period and group of people, group of people, different groups of people, different time period. Galatians chapter 3, <coughs> we'll look at verse 23, 23. All right, in the church age, we're saved by faith, amen? Amen. All right, we're saved by faith, okay. Now, they claim right here that this is a time of faith or the law, the Old Testament. It's law, right? It's a time of the law. So anti-dispensationalists, they would like to claim that everyone was saved by faith from beginning 
to the end. That's not true. You got to understand this, is that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our salvation, did not come until after the law. Now, the common sense thinking is because why? Because Jesus did not die on the cross yet. Until Jesus died on the cross, then you can have faith in him. Believe on him for salvation. But during this time period before, you don't have that. Now, there's a pretty saying that anti-dispensationalists would like to say. They would like to say that even though Jesus did not yet die on the cross yet, they put their faith ahead of time on the promise of the Messiah, and that's how they got saved. Well, that's a pretty saying, but that's really, really wrong. Amen. Because the reason why is there is no verse to support that. Yeah. There, your only verse to support it, so they will try to use Hebrews 11 to support it. By faith, by faith, by faith. Okay, that's true, but that's not the same faith in Jesus alone. That faith, if you look at Hebrews 11, I mean, don't believe me. Look at Hebrews 11 if you don't believe me, okay, in your spare time. Hebrews 11 had faith in it, but don't tell me there was no works in that faith. By faith, Noah built an ark. Building an ark is a lot of work. If you don't think so, you should try building a church building, okay? That's a lot of work. By faith, Abraham left his homeland. That's a work. When you give up your homeland and go to a foreign nation and move across some different country and you pay a lot of money, don't tell me that's not a lot of work, especially when you're moving stuff. Me and Brother Robert were moving this big couch, and if you tell me that that's not a work, then you're crazy, okay? Yeah. All right? I, I, I will not be an anti-dispensationalist in that sense, okay? <laughs> okay, if you read the passage at Hebrews chapter 11, all right? By faith, Noah forsook Egypt to become the leader of his people. By faith, look at all these people, what they did. As a matter of fact, if you keep reading Hebrews 11, by faith, these people faced persecution, torture, sawn asunder. That's a lot of work. See, so Hebrews 11 should prove the opposite, that it's faith and works. It's not this kind of faith without works. This is a faith and work system. Now, if you don't believe me, keep reading Galatians 3, verse 23. But before what? Faith came, we were kept under the what? Law. No, this law, we were saved by faith alone, not works. No. Shut up unto the faith, which should when? Afterwards be revealed. See that? What are you going to do about that case? So the faith was shut up. Some people will like to claim, well, you know, if you... Uh, Anti-dispensationists, oh, they love verse, uh, you can start out probably at verse 6 all the way through 20 maybe, from verse 6 to 20. Anti-dispensationalists love this passage because they want to prove that be law cannot give eternal life. It's only faith in Jesus Christ. Well, that's great. We fully agree with that too. We agree that we can't get saved by the law today. It's, it's got to be by faith. But what are you going to do when for thousands of years this faith was shut up and you had no access to faith until then? Then what are you going to do? That's why it makes sense. These people who did not have access to salvation by faith yet, the law could not save them, and salvation by faith was not yet available, where could they go? That's why anti-dispensationalists don't like this. They couldn't go to heaven yet. They had to go to Abraham's bosom below the earth. So Abraham's bosom, they could not have eternal life in heaven yet. They had to wait for the promised redeemer to take them up. Oh, you made that up, Pastor. Go to Ephesians 3. Come on. Come on. Come on. Go to Ephesians 3. I got to wrap this up. I got to wrap this up. I gotta wrap this up. I'm spending so much time trying to convince a person out there. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna look at Ephesians, and we're gonna look at chapter four. Actually, it's gonna be Ephesians chapter four, and we're going to look at verse eight. Verse eight. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led what? Captivity captive. He freed some captives. Who did he free? and gave gifts unto men. Verse 9, 
Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also where? Descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascendeth up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Look at that. When Jesus died, before he went up, he went down. Why? Take the captives free. And then when he first descended, he ascended up with them. Oh, I do not believe that, Pastor. You did not read Matthew 27. Matthew 27, the Bible says when Jesus resurrected, what happened? The bodies of the Old Testament saints which slept arose. Who do you think he was setting captivity captive? See that? So notice right here that this totally debunks anti-dispensationalism. There is no doubt you have to put differences. This would fail to include the most evident evidence of dispensationalism is that under the law, you don't go by Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers. All of you are liars, all right? The easiest example is the clothes that you're wearing right now. Yeah. If you have mixed fabric, that God don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> all right, now obviously you're not in the Old Testament. If you take God's name in vain, you were stoned to death. Obviously, we don't believe in that, okay? That's a different dispensation, time period. The Bible says that if you commit adultery, you should be stoned to death. Obviously, we don't believe in that. Anti-dispensationalists all of a sudden now don't believe in it yeah. because one of their preachers have been caught doing it, and they used to say adultery should be stoned to death. See, they're closet dispensationalists every single time. Now, why am I not worried whenever they try to attack dispensationalism? Because all I have to do is prove dispensationalism, and then they're going to have to backtrack and yield to closet dispensationalism. That's what happens. Romans 11 is one of the greatest evidences. They had a hard time with that. Amen. And because we kept stopping them with Romans 11 and other verses, they yielded back. Well, yeah, it is the nation of Israel, but still, dispensationalism is wrong. So you see right here that dispensationalism is apparent proof. Now, let's close with 2 Timothy 2.15. What they like to teach right here, as if your hand is already in there, rightly dividing the word of truth. This proves dividing verses to the right time period, right group of people. Anti-dispensationalists will deny it. They'll say, no, what that means is comparing scripture with scripture. Okay, now this is a problem, okay? If you think that this means comparing Scripture with Scripture, you know what comparing Scripture with Scripture is? You take one Scripture and another Scripture and you combine it together to teach you the doctrine. Is, does combine mean divide? Does combine? Okay, I'm glad you all at least know basic English. So these guys are not pastors at all. They are novices. No, they're lower than novices. Novices will at least know the difference with combine and divide. So you see that these pastors are definitely not qualified to teach the Bible, especially when resorting to anti-dispensationalism. Comparing scripture with scripture is adding one verse, combining with another verse to teach the doctrine. Dispensationalism, if you look up the word divide, it means to separate. It doesn't mean to combine. If you still deny it, I don't know what I can say that can help you besides common sense English dictionary, but maybe Genesis 1 might help you. Look at Genesis 1. He divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So he divided light from darkness. He didn't compare scripture with scripture with light and darkness and it equals some kind of grayish little color. Okay? That, maybe a rainbow. I don't know. Okay? But see, that does not make sense. But see, that's anti-dispensationalist. God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And they like to say night equals day and day equals night. Israel equals church. Church equals Israel. See, they don't, I don't know what I can say that can help you. Okay, I really don't know. <clears throat> they just like to have a mashed potato milkshake combined of doctrine that you can drink mush on. I don't know why they want to teach that. Who's the... Being, who's the adversary that wants to combine all doctrines together, combine all religions together, all peoples together to come create a one world government, a one world religion? And by the way, if you believe in dispensationalism, you'll notice that compared to every cult out there, 
you're going to find out that, wow, that proves that this church right here cannot be part of the one world religion system because no other church is going to teach this kind of stuff. See, dispensationalism is utmost proof against the new world order. That's why this doctrine is very essential if you want to expose conspiracy, expose the new world order system. If you don't want to follow what Satan's going to set up in the future at the tribulation, it's dispensationalism. It's rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, now, I could pull up another verse. Uh, I'll, I'll just do this just for good measure. We're not going to turn there for time's sake. What are you going to do with Matthew 25, huh? Matthew 25, God says you can enter inside my kingdom or you can go to hell. Why? Why do some people go to hell? Because they didn't feed the poor. They didn't clothe the sick. Some anti-dispensationalists, they would like to claim that, oh no, this is not talking about salvation right here. No, it is because it says that the people who didn't clothe and feed them went to hell. Okay? So that is a work system, feeding the poor. You don't read Matthew chapter 25. Okay, just read Matthew chapter 25. What are you going to do with Matthew chapter 5? Your hand defends you, cut it off to enter the kingdom. What are you going to do with that one? Feeding the, uh, feeding the poor, excuse me, feeding the poor and clothing the poor to enter the kingdom. Where are you going to be doing that? It is so unfortunate and sad that there are actual cases of people who are literally cutting off their hands or injuring their hands because they think they took the mark of the beast. But you know what the verse says about cutting off your hand, especially when retaining to the mark of the beast system? Why? That's entering inside the kingdom after the tribulation. See that? And people would like to call us crazy and fantastical when we try to teach some doctrine that can save somebody's life out there, somebody's soul out there, clear up the mess in doctrine. And they want to call me uh, satanic, heretical, and crazy. People who like to do that, it makes you want question their spiritual life. Have they been soul winning? Have they dealt with actual people who've been hurt without this kind of thing that could have saved them and helped them? Or are they stuck in their home turning 60 until their skin turns white? And then they just, uh, all they like to do is critique, critique, critique Bible-believing preachers because they want to make themselves look like the Trump, the Trump, the supremacy, the right kind of preacher that you all look up to. You know me, I don't do that. I send you to other churches out there. And I encourage you to submit and help out the ministries over there. See? What, I, what do I believe? I believe that the Word of God should be elevated high and lifted up above everything else. That's how it should be. All right. Amen. All right. 1 Corinthians 12. Sorry. One more, one more verse. 1 Corinthians 12, and then we'll call it a day. And I want you to jump to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then I want you to jump to Hebrews 13 as well. The most popular argument, you're going to hear charismatics quoting, and then anti-dispensationalists surprisingly join the charismatics in this. They like to quote the verse, Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. So this is somehow proof against dispensationalism. So because they think that because God's the same from beginning to end, thus there cannot be any differences in between. That's what they claim. Uh, no, that's just wrong, okay? So we'll look at Hebrews 13 at that verse, and then we're going to compare 1 Corinthians 12. And by the way, this is not thoroughly debunking all anti-dispensationalism arguments too. All right? This is just a layout that would be common sense, very plain, very clear. If I were to go in thorough mode, then you don't want to see that. Trust me. Look at Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. So this is the verse that they would like to quote concerning Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Verse 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. See that? That's their verse. <laughs> That's their verse. So proving that God cannot be a dispensationalist because he has to be the same from beginning to end. Uh, that's not true. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is a simple verse. We're going to look at verse 4. Verse 4. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, now there are what? Diversities of gift, but the who? Oh, wow. 
Hebrews 13, 1 Corinthians 12, the end. All right, let's close.